Hey, if you're watching this video, it's because you've clicked on the link to watch our worship service at the Presbyterian Church of Nevada. I'd just like to welcome you and uh, greet you on behalf of the church. My name is Adam Smith. I am the pastor uh, here at the church, and we're continuing on in our life and ministry together, even though we're sheltering in place and doing our best to protect and uh, love our neighbor as ourselves during this time of COVID-19. And we're so glad that you found us. We know that God has brought you here in some way, shape, or form, and we're just so glad and so thrilled that you're here. If you have any questions about the church, want to get to know us a little bit more, visit our website, pcnovato.org. Uh, we're in the process of creating an entirely new website, but right now, all of our information's on there. Again, welcome. Glad you're here. Let us worship together. God, you are infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, glorious in holiness, full of love and compassion, abundant in grace and truth. Your works everywhere praise you, and your glory is revealed in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Therefore, we praise you, blessed and holy Trinity, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me. out from Vacation Bible School and I am so excited about that except there's only one problem it's Rocky Railway and, and we're doing a train bound for glory but I don't know where the train is so I need you guys to help me find it and we're gonna do that right now so there's a few trains around here. I thought we'd go check them out and find out which one is the train bound for glory. So we're gonna start with the smart train. Here we go. You know, for a smart train, you'd think there'd be a stop at glory. But I sure don't see one. Is this the train bound for glory? The train bound for glory? Yeah, is this the train that's bound for glory? These, these trains don't go anywhere. These trains just stay here. This is a train town. Oh. They, they just they, they just stay here? The whole time. They just kind of go in a little circle and that's it. Oh no, no, we're we're going to glory. We're bound for glory. Oh, Thank okay. you. Alright. Whoa. I think this Amtrak is too fast and too loud. That's Thomas the Tank Engine. He's not going to Glory. He's going to Sodor. Excuse me, sir. Uh, yeah. We're look. We're looking for the train bound for Glory. Bound for where? Bound for Glory. Is this train? I think this might be it, you guys. I don't see any train tracks anywhere. But let's go see. <gasps> you guys, do you think this is it? Do you think we found it? 
Excuse me, can, can I help you? Hi, yes. Do you know, is this the train bound for glory? Why yes, yeah it is. You have no idea how many places we've been to find this train. This is awesome. Oh, you need a ticket to ride this train. Oh, okay. Well, um, I'm gonna need a few. Okay, how many do you need? About 110. Oh my. Okay, well just, just take them all. Oh, okay, thank you. Now this is the train bound for glory. Yes ma'am it is. <laughs> Enjoy your ride! Heavenly Father, we are here to listen. We are here to be mindful of what Holy Spirit is speaking to us. We are here to be the body of Christ in the world. To be loved but to also extend that love to each other and to the world. Let us listen this morning for your will for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Got a question for you this morning, friends. And I seem to always start with a question, it seems like, whenever we get together. But let me just ask it. Who do you listen to? That's the question. Who do you listen to in your life? Now, I'm not talking about music artists. I'm not talking about your favorite band or composer or music. So get that out of your head. And if your answer was your spouse, well done. Well done. But that's not what we're talking about this morning either. But that's a great answer. Who do you listen to in your life is the question. Why am I asking that? Where do you turn for information? When major things happen in our society, when major events occur, how do you interpret them? Who do you listen to to help process what you've seen or heard or been shaped in front of you so that you can gain understanding and wisdom. Who do you listen to? Because we all listen to somebody or something. And part of it, it has to do with how we grew up. It has to do with our values. It has to do with what we learned from our moms and dads and friends and mentors or our guardians from what we learned in school. Part of it has to do with what region of the country we grew up in, the cultural understandings of a particular region or area, a certain lifestyle that we choose. So who do you listen to for guidance, for direction, when things happen in this world around you? because we all do it. I ask this because I think it's really important as we consider how to best be the church in the context of the world that we live in. Because as the church of Jesus Christ, we have a lot of answers to share with the world when it comes to big events and big issues of our time. Armed with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have good news. We had good news of love for the world. The people in Corinth are asking this exact same question in our text. Who do we listen to? Because they have some options in front of them. You know, the Apostle Paul is the one that founded the church in Corinth. And then he left, and something happened, and his travel schedule got messed up. He didn't come back when he said he was going to come back with the people. And something happened, some falling out between he and the community there. And all of a sudden, there's these other leaders that are arising within the city. These other leaders that are questioning Paul's authority and saying, you know what? We're performing more powerful miracles than Paul did. 
Paul's not even really an apostle when you think about it. And so they're questioning Paul's authority and the people, the people don't know who to follow after. Should they continue to follow Paul or should they continue now to follow after these new leaders, these seemingly more powerful leaders that say they represent God? They're asking that question, who do we listen to? The same question that we ask. And in today's world, there are so many other voices out there, so many claiming to be righteous or to represent God. Who do we follow after? How do we know if it's God or not speaking through the people that we listen to? How did the people know to follow after Paul? Because we know in Romans, they actually do follow after Paul. As Paul's on his way to Jerusalem, he, he picks up uh, the tithes that this community has given for the poor in Jerusalem. He collects it from them which is a part of what he'd asked, which is how we know that somehow they've reconciled, that somehow they've chosen Paul over these other leaders in the end. Why did they choose Paul? I think the second letter to the people in Corinth, the church in Corinth, gives us some help in thinking about how we decide who we listen to in this world how we listen to in this day and age and time because it is such a hard thing. So what do we do? We could go all the way through 2 Corinthians and I could keep you here all afternoon and into the evening and we could lay out the first seven chapters where Paul makes his case, I'm the one. But we're not going to do that. You don't want to stick around that long. And we got other things to get to today. Now, we're going to focus right here at the end, the scripture passage that Ariel read for us. This is the very end. This is his farewell address. It says, finally, finally, to sum up, let me share with you this lasting message. And this is what he says. We've already read it. What I want to lift up here is this is the only letter, when he does his farewell address, the only letter where he ends with this Trinitarian formula, where he ends with this Trinitarian nature of God. And no other letter does he do that. And I always kind of threw that away as, oh, well, it's just kind of a written benediction. They probably used it in worship. It's a liturgical piece, and that's the purpose for it being in here. But I have come to think that it's more than that. That this Trinitarian understanding of God really helps shape all that Paul has said in this letter. It shapes his plea to the community to listen to him. It shapes the nature of who the community is and how the community should operate and who the community should listen to. This Trinity of God, which I think is fitting considering it's Trinity Sunday, that this should be part of this text. What does it have to mean? What does it have to say for us, though, in thinking about who we follow after in today's world? Because I think it does have wisdom for us. The first piece of wisdom that I think this text gives us here at the end is that it reminds us, the Trinity reminds us that we are a part of one another, that we are not alone, that we are not simply individuals, but that we belong to one another. We are a community. You see, if God is community, we're thinking about the Trinity here, if God exists in relationship to God's self, if God represents true community, then what does that mean for us who are the body of Christ, who are imitating Christ, called to be in community together and with God? It means that we imitate Christ, doesn't it? 
that we serve and we're not here to be served, that we love our neighbor, giving of ourselves for them on their behalf? Do we sow the seeds of unity and mutual understanding and social justice as Christ did? I think the voices that we need to listen to in our world today represent these things. They're voices of compassion and empathy and unity and mutual understanding and social justice. The voices we need to listen to today are the voices that cry against racism and prejudice and instead say we are one. We are in this together, fellow brothers and sisters. The voices we need to listen to are the ones that stand up for and in solidarity with the weak and the vulnerable. The voices that extend bridges of hope and love that lead to dialogue, true dialogue entrusting relationship that leads to action. Because the Trinity reminds us that we are a part of each other. We are responsible in part for each other. And that's hard for us sometimes, especially in our very highly individualistic society, to look at a Trinitarian model of community that reminds us of our interconnectedness with one another. But I know what you're thinking. You know, we're not God. This is God's perfect relationship, and therefore, we're not God. We, we don't have that kind of relationship with each other. But maybe we do. It's different, but similar. Think about this with me. I'm going to get nerdy for just a minute to talk about the Trinity. Bear with me. You can nerd along with me. It's fun. In the Trinity, the persons of God, they indwell within each other. We have creator, redeemer, sustainer, father, son, Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call these three different persons that make up the oneness of the Trinity, they indwell in one another. As Jürgen Moltmann, theologian, talks about, they somehow intermix with each other, intermingle. They are one, yet remain, their remain and keep their individuality, but somehow indwell within each other in such a way where they can't be pulled apart from one another. And the truth is, we can indwell in each other as human beings through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do it by ourselves, but we can indwell in one another through the Holy Spirit to imitate this true community of God, where we give a piece of ourselves in all of our encounters with each other, where we make ourselves vulnerable enough to where we give up something of ourselves and in return receive something of someone else, where we can indwell in each other, where we change each other, where we aren't locked in to our particular ideology and worldview and the way we see things. Instead, true community allows us to be reshaped by one another, to be reformed together in trusting relationship. I read in our passage this morning this about this holy kiss that Paul invites the people of Corinth to share, and it's this reminder of this mutual indwelling of the Holy Spirit, this intimacy, this vulnerability, this call to community that shares lives together. It's a different way of being. It's a different way of thinking about the world and of being in community together. The voices that we need to listen to in our day and age need to be these voices where people matter, where we are one together, but not one where we pass over injustice, one where we experience that injustice with each other where we hear the stories of one another, and those stories change us. They make us see reality from others' perspectives. 
Because when we indwell in each other like that, then our understanding of the world and of God broaden. And we can better love, love as God loves. So that's one bit of wisdom I think we can pull from this farewell address that Paul gives us. And there's another piece, too, that I wanted to lift up. Another little bit of wisdom that I think is important for us to think about as we think about the Trinitarian nature of God and who we're called to listen to in this world. And that's the fact that we, you and me, all of us, are in the process, in the middle of being transformed by God. We're not done yet, in other words. We're not locked in. We don't have it all figured out. God is still bringing us into new life in our individual lives, but also in our communal lives, in our lives as a church, in our lives as a society, a community together. We are not locked into one way of seeing the world. Wherever we grew up, however we learned, the values that we hold near and dear we're not locked into those things, but we're open to hearing God anew, God who is reshaping us as God continues to usher in the kingdom of God as we move closer and closer to that reality. This means we're not stuck in our certain tribes, in our certain ways of being. We're not stuck in tribes of exclusion and narrow thinking. We don't have to stay there. We can be reshaped by God as we mutually dwell within each other, as we open ourselves up and risk being together to hearing another's plight, being open to say, hey, I might be wrong. Because as human beings, we can be wrong. We are wrong often. For the longest time, and I'll just give you an example. For the longest time, I looked at the world through one way, through one particular lens. Partly because it's what I knew. It's what I, I grew up with. It was part of my social identity as a Southern boy. I had certain radio stations or TV stations I would watch. I had certain understandings of the world around me that I just picked up as a part of being in a certain area of the world. I just assumed they were the right world way. I mean, come on, I, us Texans, you know, everything's bigger in Texas. We got ego issues, right? We've got it figured out. But it's not just us Texans, it's everybody. We all think we have it figured out, right? So I assumed I did. I assumed I had the right answers. And I struggle with that. I struggle with that as I went to school, as I continued to learn. I struggle with that in seminary as I learned to rely a lot more on God and a lot less on me and what I thought I knew. So here I am. I'm serving as a youth director in Florida. And I remember driving home, and I remember this vividly. I still remember it today. I remember driving home, and I remember pulling off the road on my way home that day. I was listening to that same radio station I'd listened to growing up, the same one I knew, the same voice that I knew. And I came to a realization that day. I came to a realization that what I was listening to was destructive. It was harmful. It was harmful to me. It was harmful to others. It was harmful to so many people in so many different ways. Not because of just the content, but the method to which the content was given. I realized that what this station had done was to divide people. 
it was really good at saying us versus them. Or it was really good at demonizing a group of people for something. Or scapegoating another group for something else. It was really good at pushing the blame off on groups and individuals of people. It served only to separate and to divide people. And I realized that this is broken. Through all my Bible study, all my education, and, and in my prayer life, and in my relationship with other people in the life of the church, and in my serving and mission work, and interacting with people from all different walks of life, I came to see that this is not right. That this worldview is not the right worldview or the right ideology. I came to realize that the Holy Spirit was working inside me to offer me an alternative way of seeing things. Looking at things through the lens of Jesus Christ first and not through the lens of some cultural ideology I'd grown up with. And when I came to that realization that this is the Holy Spirit at work, broadening my perspectives, opening my eyes to the reality of Christ, Christ first, the love of Christ that brings together, it was like a weight was lifted off my shoulders. I don't have to think that way because other people do or because I'm pressured to. No, I am free to think through the lens of Christ. And it was freeing. And it's freeing to this day. I don't ascribe to particular ideologies in this world before they are filtered through a lens of Christ and through Christ's love for us. And I think what Paul does here is help us filter the world through a Trinitarian lens, through the lens of God that is perfect community, so that we can see what true community is about, what it means to see each other, what it means to sit at a table with each other, what it is to indwell in each other so that we don't demonize, so that we don't other, so that we don't do those things that separate us, but so that we see our oneness, our image of Godness in each other. And we start from there. We build bridges from there. We say, you are loved and you are valuable, as am I. And we see each other for who we truly are in Christ. The voices we need to listen to in our world today are those voices, are the ones who are willing to come to the table in genuine, mutual love and the valuing of one another, to be able to address issues that are of vital importance in our society and in our world. We need people interested in the voices that are telling us to be in relationship with each other so we can truly listen to each other. So we stop talking past each other and through each other and at each other, but instead with each other. Friends, I think the church has a voice in all of our conversations going on in the world today. And it's this voice filtered through the lens of love. Let me ask you this, and I'll ask you again. Who do you listen to in your life? Because friends, first and foremost, it should always be Jesus Christ. First and foremost, it should be the Holy Spirit speaking the mission and the words and the life of Jesus Christ into others. We should be attuned to those voices within our society so that we recognize them when we hear them, so that they call to us and remind us of the love of God. Friends, 
Let us listen. For God is speaking. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise O oh god our creator and redeemer in your wisdom you made all things and sustained them by your power god of love and peace you formed us in your image to love and to serve you but we forget your promises and abandoned your commandments in your mercy you did not reject us but still claimed us as your own. God of love and of peace, blessed is Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord. He took upon himself the weight of our sin and carried the burden of guilt. He shared our life in every way and though tempted was sinless to the end, living a perfectly holy life, exemplifying peace. God of love and of peace, baptized as your own, he went willingly to his death and by your power was raised to new life. In his dying and rising, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made us a new covenant by water and the spirit. God of love and of peace, Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine from the gifts you have given us. And we celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy offering of ourselves, that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. 
God of love and of peace, we pray for all nations. Let the message of your saving power spread throughout the world that the dominion of death is no more. We pray for our world that we embody your compassion, grace, love and mercy even in the midst of this time of pandemic and fear god of love and of peace we pray for healing make the weak strong the sick healthy the broken whole and confirm those who serve them as agents of your love we pray for comfort for all those in distress grant mercy grant relief grant refreshment God of love and of peace, we pray for our communities who have been torn apart by violence. We pray for our brothers and sisters who have suffered under systemic and systematic oppression. We pray for those charged to safeguard citizens. We thank you for the willingness to protect and serve. May all of us be ever mindful of the preciousness of human life, unique, and beloved children of yours. God of all love and of peace, receive these prayers. Gracious and loving God, we pray at this time for doctors and nurses, for donors and volunteers, all of those who are here at PCN right now at the blood drive that we're hosting. Be with them. We, we pray also for all the protesters, for all the police officers. We pray for the safety of all people in the middle of this time and place that we're in. We pray for Emily who has just entered the National Guard. We pray for educators and students at this time. For Lord, we know that through this time of COVID, a lot's going to be affected, including our education system. We pray that our educators have rest that they need, that our students also find ways to relax and prepare for the year to come. Be with the administration and all the people as they make tough decisions moving forward in the coming year. And we give thanks. Carolyn Guerin gives thanks for all the prayers that we've had for her sons, for Patrick and for Robert, who are police officers. We give thanks that they've been kept safe and pray that they find rest as they've been extremely busy as of late. And Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for unity. We pray that the seeds of division be cast out, that we find a way to be the community you call us to be as a nation, to make love what we're about. Lord, we pray all of these things in your precious name. We know and trust God that you're always with us in cold and in warmth, in darkness and in light. In every season and in every moment of our lives, you hold us all in your loving embrace and you promise to never let us go. Trusting indeed that you are always there, we pray to you now as your son taught us praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, in just a few moments, we'll be having communion. As a reminder, we will eat the bread together to symbolize our corporate nature. And then, as you are all ready, drink the cup separately to symbolize our individual accountability before God. Take it some time now to prepare your hearts as we go before God to join at his table.
On the night of his arrest, Jesus took the bread from the table. He blessed it. He broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this too in remembrance of me. For every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Just a reminder, we'll be taking, we'll be partaking in the bread together as a symbol of unity and be partaking in the cup individually as a sign of our individual response to God. Friends, the body of Christ, let us partake together. And the cup of salvation. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, fall afresh on us. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds. Holy Spirit, having now been nourished by bread and cup, May we go into the world renewed, refreshed, having tasted that final feast that we will one day taste in heaven. May we share that communion with our brothers and sisters here and now and in this place to be about your good news everywhere we go. In the loving and saving name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the
Friends, as we go from this place today, go with your hearts and minds open. Continue to listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking in the world today, speaking in the wilderness, speaking in and through people, even those we might least expect. You'll know the voice when you hear it. It'll be the voice of God, a voice that reminds us of Christ. Follow after it. Listen closely. For we are disciples of Jesus Christ together. And I receive the benediction. God knows not only your name, but every hair on your head. So in all things, be a mirror and reflect Christ's compassion, grace, love, and mercy to all. And all of God's children say together, amen.